Good afternoon and welcome to the IUPUI Center for Translating Research into Practice Scholar of the Month series. My name is Steve Vweg and I'm the Associate Director of the Center and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this opportunity to hear from one of our campus scholars talking about their translational research. So let me share my screen so we can get started with our introductions and share some information with you. We're very excited today to have Professor Amro Aweshe with us. Before we get to that, we like to remind you that our center was founded by Professor Emeritus Sandra Petronio. Dr. Petronio is herself a translational scholar. And when she and Emeritus Chancellor Bantz came to campus, what they recognized was that there was an amazing amount of translational research occurring right here in Indianapolis where people are generating knowledge and using it to solve problems in the community. When Professor uh, Charles R. Bantz stepped down from being the chancellor, he moved to the position of executive director of our center, and he is now in leadership around carrying the mission forward and helping us to promote, identify, and encourage translational research. So today, many of you are already familiar with Zoom, but we do want to remind you of some things. Please stay muted and uh, keep your background noise to a minimum during the conversation. There'll be a time when we invite you, the, however, to unmute and turn on your cameras and be part of a community where we can have a conversation and discussion with the questions that Professor Aweshe raises. If you'd like, you can also type your questions and comments into the chat. We'll keep a watch for those and share that information. With, uh, with everybody as we move along. We intend to record this presentation, so it'll be available later. If you see this and then realize somebody would like to see it, um, we'll be able to share that with them and you can see it on our YouTube channel. And of course, you will receive a post-event evaluation. We hope that you'll take just a moment to answer a few questions to help us know how we're doing and things that we can do for the future. Uh, the there's a lot going on with the Center for Translating Research and Practice. One of the things is that you can get continuing education for attending this. If you attend um, all of these sessions, you can get some credit to put onto your, uh, your resume. You could visit IU Expand to learn more and to sign up for that opportunity. To keep up with all the things that are happening, we invite you to follow us in your favorite way on social media. You can uh, add us to your Instagram account or follow us on Twitter, and of course, we are available on Facebook, and we have, as I mentioned, a YouTube channel where you can see past recordings of all of our events. One of the features that the center offers is a connection with ScholarWorks at IUPY. It's an opportunity to see our faculty's uh, scholarly works in one central place. So, for example, if you go to our website and look up Dr. Oweshe, you could see a summary of his work, and on his page is a list of all the um, available uh, documents and manuscripts that he's written with a link that takes you right to the information. You can also click at the top on the ScholarWorks page itself if you want to go there directly, but we're really excited that this information is available to you so easily and accessible, and that's a way that we can share the information and understand some of the things that are happening out there in the world to solve problems in our community. Next month, our uh, session is going to be with Helen Sanamatsu, who is in the Heron School of Art, and she uses design methodology to enrich community relationships to better fit community needs. So join us at the end of August to meet Helen and to hear more about her translational work. But today we have with us Professor Amru Amra Aweshe, and he's going to talk to us about sustainability. And Dr. Aweshe is Associate Professor of, of Operations and Safety, uh, that's supply chain. Sorry, I can't read my own notes. <laughs> he's the Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Management in the Kelly School of Business, and we are delighted that he's here with us today. So allow me to unshare my screen and to ask him to share his screen, turn on his microphone and uh, and his camera and to take it away. So welcome, Dr. Oweshe. Good afternoon, everybody. I assume you can see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction and the wonderful resource uh, on ScholarWorks. I, full disclosure, I didn't even know that exists and that makes the work looks awesome. So I, I appreciate uh, everything you folks uh, do. I, I wanna thank everybody that's here today. Uh, 
please, uh, this is very interactive. So at any time, if you have any question or anything is not clear or you're not hearing me or you just want me to elaborate on a, a point, please unmute yourself and uh, kind of uh, let's try and make this as interactive as possible. Uh, uh, my name is Amro Weishi, and I want to talk to you today a little bit about your personal social responsibility, our personal social responsibility. And, and I want to be very clear that it's it's every person's individual work, okay? And so it's our relationship with the environment. It's our relationship with society. When I say our, you know, I want to be very clear, it's every individual's own interaction with the environment and society. In society. And so I hope that, uh, you know, my key takeaways is that I want to explain a little bit about what sustainability is, uh, help you understand a little bit about your own personal sustainability, and then draw insights on maybe what we can change in our personal lives from examples that I've had uh, and seen that work in uh, business and, and in industry. Uh, with that, I'll kind of uh, start talking a little bit uh, about sustainability, but before uh, I begin, you know, I want to show you this. And so this is a picture from about 150 years ago. Uh, if you can see, there's a fine gentleman standing there just to kind of give you a perspective of the height of this. And this is a pile of bison. Uh, you know, as America was expanding into the West, we were kind of slaughtering bison and almost killed off the entire species. And so when you look at a picture like that, and you can just imagine the amount of heads, right? That's all just heads, just bison heads. And again, uh, the person standing there is just for perspective. Uh, you look at it and they thought, well, isn't that not, not sustainable? Or what were they thinking? You know, why are they doing this? And it probably makes it cringe. You're thinking, okay, well, this is bad. It's good. We don't do that anymore, right? The world's changed. We've advanced. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. And you look at this now, and this is a recent picture. And that's a child there. Uh, that's a river, but I hope you can see the river is covered in plastic. It looks, I mean, he's on a boat here just to kind of keep things in perspective. And that's a river covered in plastic. And what he's doing is he's picking out uh, plastic to be recycled. Okay, so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that and, and what it means as you think about it. And then this is the plastics in our ocean. And that's just kind of one example of what we're uh, gonna talk about. You know, microplastics are growing. Uh, we're seeing it come up in fish population. We're seeing fish population being impacted by it. And eventually it's affecting us. And you think, you know, go back to the bison picture. Does this not make you think, okay, well, what are we doing? What can we do a little bit differently? Uh, can we think a little ab about things a little bit differently? And so, you know, I want to ask you all a question and trying to keep this interactive. So, Nuri, if you can please uh, share the first uh, poll question. It looks like most people have answered. So there you go. Let's see the results. And, and so with the vast majority of us, I assume everybody can see the results, right? Yes. The poll results. Yep. Uh, the vast majority of us, it's 90% or more, right? 90% of the time or 100% of the time. Uh, for some people, it's not a lot. And so that's okay. That's perfect. So let's keep that in the back of our minds. And Nuri, if we can share the second question, please. And so again, 100% of the time for 95% of us that turn off the water after we wash our hands. And so we're talking about actions. I mean, that's what we do. I believe you're all kind of speaking honestly. I'd really like to know why you do it. Okay. And so now I think is a perfect time, Nuri, if you don't mind. The third question, please. So why, why do you turn off the water? Why do you turn off electricity when you don't need it? That 95% plus. So about a third of us think it's better for the world. Uh, about 20% makes them feel good. It feels like the right thing to do. So I, I'm going to classify that as, okay, so it, it's better for the world, better for everybody else. It makes me feel good. It's right. But for about half of us, it's we pay the utility bill. There's an associated cost with it, right? I, I go to, if I don't turn off the tap, I get the bill at the end of the month. If I don't turn off the lights when I leave, I get the higher electricity bill. I kind of see that. I realize that. So and this is the last question we're going to have now that hopefully sets the tone for the rest of the presentation. Question four, please, if you may. So when you go to a hotel or an Airbnb, how often do you turn off the water after you wash your hands? Remember, 95% of us says 
we do it 100% of the time, right? So at home, we turn it off 100% of the time. But when you're at a hotel or an Airbnb, how often do you turn off the water after you wash your hands? And again, it's the same 95%, 94% in change is it's 100% of the time. But you think about the main reason that the majority of us said we turn off the water at home is because we pay the utility bill. Think about when you go to a hotel, you don't pay the water bill. You don't pay the at an Airbnb, you don't pay the electricity bill when you're there for a week or so. Yet we have these actions that we do that impact us outside, not because it's better for the world. So those people, the, ha the majority of us said that we do it because it's better for the world, because we pay the bill, not because it's better for the world, not because we feel it's the right thing to do. And so those of us that when we do that, when we go to a hotel or an Airbnb, we're, mo we're changing our actions, we're changing our behavior. So now I want you to think of like the most evil people you can imagine. And so these are, these are two that top to, pop to the top of my head is I think, think about these, a horrible person, right? So Mr. Burns, perhaps, you know, or Corella DeVille, perhaps one of the most evil, some of the most evil people around. When they go to a hotel, do they turn on the faucet? and go out for dinner? Do they run the bathtub on full hot, keep the drain open? So full hot water, hot water is a very, very, very expensive resource. So not only are you wasting the, the water, which is a non-renewable resource, right? It's, we're running out of water, so we know that. So you're wasting the water, but hot water. So you're spent energy to bring that water temperature to warm, super hot. So do you think they turn on the hot water and go out for dinner? Right, it probably makes a lot of noise, so they're not going to do it in a hotel room. But do, do you think evil people do that? Think of if, if if these two people don't signify evil in your mind. Think of who you would define as the most evil person you can imagine. Do you think they turn off, turn on the hot water in a hotel and leave? Did anybody think so? I, I'd agree with you, folks. Right? They don't. There, even though they don't pay for the energy. They don't pay for the water. They don't pay for the utility. Their mind is set around, this is something we shouldn't be doing. And so we don't do it. And so what I want to, once we've established that, once we, we get that, uh, I hope, excuse me, that starts to drive the question, well, if that's the case, why don't we all do more sustainable things? Why don't we all do different things? And, and it's driven by uh, two things primarily is, uh, number one, information. We don't know enough about what we do or what impact what we do has on everything else as it cascades. So information. So I hope to share information with you on that. And the second one is cost. Okay. We don't fully pay or appreciate the cost of everything because it's not baked in correctly. And again, I'll give you some examples of that as we go on. And so sustainability, as you start to think about sustainability, we think about a whole bunch of things. The UN Sustainable Development Goals or UN SDGs, the end SDGs are one way we can define sustainability. But as you can see, there's so many dimensions. There's so many ways we can define it. What does it mean? What does it look like? Am I, if I'm good on, you know, goal number two, but I'm bad on goal number 15, do they average out? Do they balance out? Is there a weighting associated? Where should I focus? And that creates a lot of issues. This tension we have between different elements of sustainability creates a tension on what we do, how we tackle it, and what that looks like. And so I'll tell you how we define it in business, and I'll get, and I kind of define seven words for you that I'll use a little bit later on, and then kind of give you an example of how you can look about sustainability a little bit different. And so Sustainable development is the idea or the thought that we can live within the planetary bounds of the earth, okay? That we can continue to grow, improve our livelihoods, improve uh, what we experience, increase the standard of living, but still living within our planetary boundaries, okay? CSR, corporate social responsibility, is what corporations do to ensure that they have a strategy or they're thinking about their sustainability impact. Another thing, a way that's defined is ESG, environmental and social governance, which is really hot and kind of in the press, in the news now. And 
outside the scope of what I want to talk about today, because it's this idea that we're trying to blend. If we go back to the SDGs, we're trying to blend these 17 things and trying to give you a number. Okay. Just if you imagine if you're trying to describe the perfect uh, partner, okay, uh, for a research project. If you're de describing this partner for a research project, well, there's a number of characteristics, right? Are, are they hardworking? Are they fast to reply? Are they, uh, do, they do they work the same hours I do? Or are we in the same time zone? Uh, do they have a good network? Can we use my network? Do they have the data? Do I have the data? All, all these little things. But at the end of the day, you want to get a simple yes, no. Are they a good research partner? Are they not a good research partner for me? It, it, and that's the hard part. Different people might have different weightings. Different people might have different criteria. And that's kind of about what I hope you think about at the end of the day. What I want you to, to think about is it, the same thing for ESG. And so while that's important, I think that has value. I, I really want us to move on beyond that. Okay. And so the triple bottom line, we, we all know bottom line, thinking of the financial impact. Well, for corporations, the triple bottom line is the financial, environmental, and societal impact. But for us as individuals, we can think of our wealth that we have in the bank, right? But let's also think about our societal wealth and then our health overall as the impact of the environment. And that's how we can translate that into our personal social responsibility. And this idea of circularity, okay? So how can you think of the world in a circular fashion, okay? We're used to take, make, dispose. We buy something, we use it, and we throw it away, okay? But as you start to think about circularity, you start to think things about a little, a little bit differently. And so while for companies, we have a difficult time measuring and talking about what's important, it's the same thing for people. So a lot of us, you've been thinking maybe about greenhouse gases or greenhouse gas emissions right now. What's the carbon impact of the company? That's one way to look at it. OK, but I really want you to think of three things, Ener energy, emissions, waste and water. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But uh, I know we had something similar to like this when I was in high school, I assume, whenever they taught you this, but the water cycle. And I, I want to take this idea away from the people that think, oh, climate change only affects the heat. OK, there's all these resources, natural resources play in together. OK. As the planet heats up a little bit more, it impacts the water cycle, okay? So it impacts what water goes back in, how much water we consume. If we draw water out, what happens to that water? Waste, okay? As we throw out more things, what happens to that waste as it leaches into the ground, as it leaches into the, into the water we drink, okay? The water that we use, if it is a little bit dirty or... Uh, kind of gets sent off. What happens to that? What does that look like? Okay. And so I hope that you think about how these three parts interplay together. And then we're going to talk about a couple of examples uh, for people and what they look like. Any questions so far? So I'm going to go back to uh, a cup of tea. Okay. And so I want to th you to think uh, of you uh, making a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Okay. And so you think about it, uh, think about where the product is coming from, how is it being used, and then how is it being disposed of at the end of its life. And these three things we're going to come back to in our example as we talk about the cup of tea. So I talked about sustainability in general, but I just want you to worry about three elements, energy, water, and waste, okay? The energy, how much energy do you consume at home? And where does it come from? Okay, so meaning what is the source that is generating that energy that you're using? The second thing I want you to think about is water. How much water do you consume? And what kind of wastewater do you generate? What happens to that wastewater at the end of its life? Or as you, because you think about it, if you mix oil with water, that's not going to go back into the water cycle, right? Or it won't go back in the same way that you imagine it. That's why you kind of see those uh, pictures, drains into a waterway, don't dump oil here, okay? So think about that on your own personal home consumption. And then waste. What kind of waste do you generate at home and where does it all end up? So for energy, there's two real things you need to think about. 
your energy source, what percent of your energy is renewable or RE? Okay, so renewable energy is energy that comes from a source that is not depleted when it is consumed or a source that's not depleted as it's used to generate the electricity, such as hydropower, wind farm, or a solar farm, okay? A lot of us, when we think about energy, uh, we start renewable energy, RE, uh, we think about having solar panels on the top of our house. And that's a, a great way to generate renewable energy on site, okay? And it's a lot of value add. But you can also purchase renewable energy from your local utility, okay? So within Indy, uh, whether you have Duke or AES, uh, IPL, Indiana Power Light, uh, they both have the option for you to buy renewable energy, okay? It's not the same electrons that are coming straight to your house, but they will buy that electricity from, for you on your behalf and then add it to the grid. So if 10% of their consumers want renewable energy, they have to buy at least 10% of their uh, energy from renewable sources and they feed that into the grid. That's called additionality, okay? And the more they add, the more people choose to do that, the more they will add, more renewable energy they will add onto the uh, grid. The other thing I want you to think about is energy efficiency or EE. And energy efficiency is using less energy to perform the same task or produce the same light. Think of a light bulb, okay? A, a traditional incandescent light bulb that consumes 60 watts of energy. The equivalent is about five watts in an LED bulb, okay? So you get the same light, the same brightness in your room, and you save 50, 55 watts by swapping out from a incandescent light bulb to a uh, energy efficient LED light bulb. And so now think about that across your house, okay? Think about that in your uh, air conditioning unit, in your heating unit, okay? The more efficient what you have as a source is, uh, the less energy you consume to give you the same output, the same impact. So the US is uh, per capita, is one of the highest consumers of energy at home. Okay, so our homes, and that's why I, you know, today's talk is just about our personal impact. Our homes consume a lot of energy and it's a lot of wasted energy. Okay, it's around going back to, again, uh, my, my second question or third, sorry, third question. Why would you care? Okay, why would you care about changing to a programmable thermostat or changing to a smart thermostat for half of us? It's, we're gonna save energy, we're gonna save costs because we pay the utility bill. But for the other half, it's either to make us feel good or to have a better impact on the environment. And these are the kinds of things I hope as you go through your house, you think about, okay, why are the blinds up when we're leaving and it's 95 degrees in the house today and it's sunny? Let's not crank the AC up, let's lower the blinds, okay? This way you won't have heat coming into the house as much and, and you'll lower your overall energy consumption. Okay, and these are the things that I hope as you walk around the house or live your life, you start thinking about a little bit better. Okay, now our renewable energy source in the US, we have increased the share of uh, energy that comes from renewable sources in the US. We have not increased it as fast as other parts of the world. Okay, but it's not all gloom and doom. Okay, one of the largest solar farms that's gonna be coming up in the country is gonna be here in Indiana, okay? So we have additionality that's being added to the grid, okay? We have now, as consumers, the ability to make the choice to say, okay, I want renewable energy. And so when you go to your uh, utility provider and say, I would like to buy renewable energy, Okay, and so you switch your personal consumption to a renewable energy source. So actually those that booked it before these pr the prices started coming up in the last year are actually paying less for their energy than those that are getting energy from uh, non-renewable sources. Okay, because they booked it earlier on when the price was real low uh, at the renewable cost. And what you do is then you generate what we call additionality, the ability to add 
more renewable energy to the grid. And the more of us that go ahead and do that, the more renewable energy there is on the grid. Because at the end of the day, IPL, AES, the IPL, Duke, are businesses. And if you have consumers telling them, we want more renewable energy, they're going to respond to those consumers. Okay, or because they know the other option is the consumers are going to start thinking of other solutions where it's putting solar on their uh, on their rooftop or other things. And so these are the things I hope uh, you think about a little bit. Let's talk about water now. Okay, the average American family uses more than 300 gallons of water per day at home. Roughly 70% of this happens in house. I want you to think about that an average family of four using 300 gallons of water a day. Now, what I want you to imagine, because it's hard to think, uh, think about those uh, five gallon jugs that we use uh, at home. Sorry, in, in the office, you know, those five gallon jugs we have in, in the water coolers that go in the water coolers or the single gallon jugs that you buy at a store. Imagine 300 of those. And that's what gets consumed every single day that comes in. 70% of it happens indoor, 30% of it happens out in the yards. In some parts of the country, specifically out in the West, uh, that outdoor water use, watering the lawn, watering the yards is higher. It's closer to 55, 60 in some parts of the country. So can you imagine this? 60% of the consumption is to keep the yard looking green. That's why we're seeing some counties out West as they're dealing with droughts, they're thinking of what's gonna happen for the next five, 10 years have made it illegal to water an outdoor yard. Okay, so people can no longer have outdoor yards. Now, uh, in Indiana, we have not grown as the rest of the country as some parts of the world, uh, some parts of the country have grown. So this is the percentage increase in their consumption. Okay, they're starting to consume more water as they're connected to the grid. And where we see it mainly is in the West, Western states. And that happened because of uh, the, inc the, in the increased need for outdoor watering. And so there, that's why that's been kind of eliminated. I, I'd like to think they've addressed a lot of that. But a lot of you kind of wonder where we use our water and where our water use. So those 300 gallons, this is where they go, okay? About 20% to shower and bathe, 24% for the toilet, 8% for other reasons, 12% gets leaked. So that is a leak, the drip in the faucet, the drip on the toilet, uh, plunger not working too well, 17% uh, washing clothes and 19% washing hands. I'd probably bet that 19% is hopefully a little bit higher with COVID as more of us are washing our hands a little bit better, but what, I want you to think about is look at 25, almost, 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 okay, a third, more than a third, almost half of our use is between toilets and leaks. Okay, so as an individual, as a person, I, I can go out tomorrow or today in my house and I can try and I can save about 10%, 12% of my water consumption at home just by fixing the leaks, okay? This is not switching to energy efficient toilets, not switching to energy efficient tubs, shower heads, is just you thinking about where we have leaks and how we can drive that down a little bit. A quarter of our water consumption in the country is toilet water. With the exception of dogs drinking out of the toilet bowl, let's keep that on the side for a second, but think about the water that is used to flush down the toilet. It is the same water you used to drink. It is the same water you used to wash your hands. It is the same water you used to wash your clothes and your dishes. So when you think about that, does that water need to be at the same level as our drinking water? So right now in the US it is, it's at the same level as our drinking water, okay? And so we send we harm ourselves long-term by consuming that much water and, and, and wasting water in the sense that we do. So what some people are looking at, or what some, people, uh, some states have already mandated, again, especially in the West, uh, there's something called gray water, okay? So white water is, is what comes in, or fresh water is what comes in from the utility as fresh drinking water, okay? 
Gray water is water that we have used to wash our hands, wash our dishes, uh, do other things. It's relatively clean, but it's not drinking. It's not potable, non-potable. So for those of you that have been on an airplane, uh, bathroom in an airplane bathroom, they have that sign, non-potable water. Okay, that water is, it's not recycled. It's not gray water, but it's not drinking water either. And then uh, what, the black water that we use to, to flush everything out is what would come out of a toilet after being flushed. So when you think about this, there's two ways we can think about it. We can collect all the gray water in the house. And there are some places, so there's actually subsidies in Arizona that let you, let you do this. It collects all the gray water in your house. So the water that comes from the sink, dishwasher, washing machines, shower, and it collects it. And then you can use that water just for flushing toilets. 25% of our consumption, okay? With the except, again, with the exception of dogs drinking out of the toilet bowl, that water going down doesn't need to be clean to the same level as we do as our drinking water. The other thing that we're seeing in parts of the world is three water utility connections instead of two. So right now we have a fresh water connection and we have a sewage pipe coming out in most homes. So in some parts of the world, especially these cities that are newly being built up, they have a fresh water intake, a gray water intake, and a sewage pipe coming out. And so the fresh water intake is used for showering, washing hands, washing laundry and dishes. The gray water intake is clean enough for just flushing toilets, okay? And if it doesn't have soap residues, it can be used for minimal indoor water, pl water uh, pl plant watering, okay? And then the sewage would be the same sewage we have kind of coming out, okay? We are drawing more water than with our population growth and our percent, our consumption per capita, then we have, we are able to replenish uh, the, the source. So I want you to think about that as you start thinking about how much water you're consuming or what it looks like. The third thing I want to talk about today is waste. So in 2018, and this is the most recent year we have stats on, there's some prelim stats. Now post-COVID, it's a little bit higher than this, okay? So we're not going in the right direction. Uh, I don't know how much COVID kind of had to relate to that, but same thing. So Americans generate about 4.9 pounds of water, of waste, 4.9 pounds of waste per person per day. So I want you now to think about a grocery bag filled with five pounds. Okay. Think about if you had to save your garbage. Okay. If there was a room or a, a dump in, the, in your backyard where you could put your five pounds Think about now that, that pile after 365 days. That's how much waste we generate. Okay, so almost oh, 1,800 pounds every year per person. Less, very little of it gets recycled or composted and half ends up in a landfill. Okay, so I, over a typical lifespan, you generate almost 70,000 pounds of waste per person over your lifetime. So think of the Empire State Building in New York, okay? The waste generated only from 9,000 people in their lifetime. If you took that building, just kept it as a shell, it would be filled completely with their garbage from the ground up, just 9,000 people, okay? Which is typically how many people live in a neighborhood, a large neighborhood. So Nori, if you can share the last question that I had, change it up a little bit, and then we'll go through the last couple of slides. Don't worry, I don't have 43 slides, uh, just a few more. Uh, the rest are just back. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, told you a little bit in this slide, less than a third gets recycled or composted, okay? But the number is actually eight per, less than 8% overall, 6% for plastics. 6%, okay? And so you think about that, about what ends up with plastics. Really, it's two things. So if you've all bought a plastic item on the bottom of the plastic, is these, they're called infi the infinity triangle, supposedly that everything gets recycled, can be recycled forever. And inside there's a number. This is the type of plastic that is in, okay? So PET and HDPE type one and type two plastics, there's two words I hope to introduce you to today, or three actually. Uh, the first one is technically recyclable and economically recyclable. Everything is technically recyclable, okay? 
we can technically recycle almost anything we generate as humans. Okay, you spend enough energy heating it, taking it apart, just breaking it down, that item can be recycled. Okay, but economically, very little makes money. So in the US or most parts of the world, only type one and type two plastics are economically recyclable, meaning, excuse me, it's worthwhile to recycle a product to get post-consumer recyclable pellets of the product and put it back in than to go get uh, virgin or fresh plastic, the industry in the term is virgin plastic pellets uh, to make the product again, okay? That's why our recycling rates are so low. Economically, recyclable is, rate is very, very, very low. So if you look at anything plastic you've got sitting around, if you, you can put it in the recycling bin, okay? But even if it does go to a recycling facility, unless it's type one or type two, it ends up eventually in a landfill. You remember that picture of the kid on the, uh, that's, that kid is searching and sorting for type one and type two plastics, okay? So what they do, that's a big dump. So what we, used, what we used to do, and by used to is in the last decade or so, is a lot of the recycling plastics, the capacity and the facilities don't really exist for sorting at the large scale in many municipalities. They would just ship it off, ship it off overseas, okay? And overseas, they do this sorting. And again, it's only type one, type two. Type five, polypropylene, type five, is now becoming economically viable, recyclable. Okay, it's becoming economically viable. So we're seeing more municipalities pick up type five. Okay, but anything else ends up in, in the uh, in a waste landfill. And in that, as we ship it overseas, as you saw that example, there aren't waste landfill capacities. So what they end up doing is they uh, burn it and incinerate and incinerate that plastic as it goes out. And so that, as I, as I want you, the, the last word kind of, I, I want to leave you with is this idea of wish cycling, okay? Where we all uh, take a product and just put it, after we've used it, put it in the recycling bin and we're like, I wish it's gonna be recycled or I hope. We all do this, the same thing with plastics and maybe that'll change the way you operate. So as you think of this type one to seven, if you look at a product and it says type six or type seven plastic, know that it's gonna end up in a landfill. So even though you're putting it in the recycling bin, you can feel a little bit better Okay, you know it's going to end up in a landfill. All right. The, a, another real example is pizza boxes. Okay, pizza boxes, if they have grease from the pizza on the top layer, are non recyclable. Okay, so if you put a pizza box with the grease on the whole thing in the recycling bin, the whole thing ends up going to landfill. But if the grease is just on the top one, you can rip the top part out, put that in your garbage landfill. And if the, if the bottom part is clean of the pizza box, that can be recycled, okay? And so that's this idea of wish cycling as we all have is because we don't pay enough for the waste we generate, okay? We have these two huge bins. It doesn't matter how much you fail. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, in a lot of part, many, many, many parts of the world, people, consumers at home are restricted by how much waste they can generate. And so we're in... We're putting the financial penalty on them to understand, okay, you're spending more, it costs more to put the waste out there, okay? So in Ireland, you, for instance, you pay by the pound. So how much waste you generate from your house, they weigh your bin every time they tip it, the, the garbage bin, and you, you, you pay according to how much waste you generate, right? And if you think about that, if you believe in the, in the free market, right, that's what you'd want. Why are we subsidizing each other's recycling? Uh, weight habits, right? I don't pay your utility bill. We don't all share in the in the wealth of the utility bill. Let's all pay the same amount and whoever uses more or uses less, that's the same thing. It's the same thing in waste generation. Why are we all paying the same, right? When some of us generate more waste and some of us generate less waste, shouldn't we all pay our fair share of how much waste we are generating, right? And as, as a person that believes in that, I think that's something we should change in how we think about what waste we generate. And then that's gonna change how we think about where, what, we can, what we're using as energy and what we're consuming as water. So I wanna circle back and come back to my last example of think of that teacup we talked about, okay? And so if you're making a cup of tea, 
uh, think about the water. Okay, you got to boil water to make that cup of tea, right? So you think about the water kettle. Well, how much water are you putting in it? If you're only making one cup, why are you filling the kettle up halfway? Why not fill it up a little bit, right? Now that electricity that came, are you get, is it coming from a renewable source or not? Okay, and then the last thing I want you to think about is, as you make the cup, right? If you boiled half the pot, what do you do with the rest of the water? It's good water, that's fresh water that you just got and you boiled it so it's warm. Do you just flush it down the drain? Are you like my Mr. Burns, Cruella de Vil, wasting water tub in the hotel, right? And then your tea bag. What happens with the tea bag after the water? Clearly, the tea, you drink it, but the tea bag. What does it end up with? What happened to it? And where does it go? That's all the content I had today. Uh, thank you all very much for bearing with us. And so uh, I assume we have a couple of minutes for questions. If not, I'm sure we can all use the extra time to answer the plethora of emails that would have come in. <laughs> well, thank you for providing us with a lot of things to think about and some very uh, understandable ways to think about this. Well, it is 10 until the hour. We like to formally end these meetings a little bit before you all have to go back to your one o'clock sessions after lunchtime. So we want to thank you for joining us. We want to thank Dr. Awayshe for sharing this information and giving us a chance to talk about it. We want to remind you that uh, Dr. Helen Sanamatsu will be joining us in this environment on August 26th. She's waving. So please join us then to, to learn more about her work and have another conversation. We will hang out here, however, if you are dying to say something, you have another question, um, you're welcome to hang around for a few minutes, but we know that some of you have things to do. We want to thank you for coming and head on off. Um, otherwise, stay on for a little bit more conversation with Dr. Awayshe. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to stick around here and talk for as long as you folks want. <laughs>